What is up and happy Friday. If you're listening to this on Friday, welcome back to the Fortman Podcast. I am so excited for my guest today. It's been a long time coming and I'm so happy that Aiden King from Hillsong is joining me on the podcast. How are we doing? It's good to be on here, finally. We've talked about Dude, this a lot. We've, ta- we've, we've talked about this since, I know since for sure we were in Malibu for the Sadie's Pepperdine event. That was back in February, I think, but... I've been talking. I've, 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 I've been trying to recruit you uh, longer before that, but I'm um, I'm stoked that you are that, that you're joining us today. Thanks for having me. I'm pumped, man. Well, you are uh, you're my third single guest I've had on the podcast, <laughs> and you're also my th- my third. How many how many guests in total have you had? Oh, <laughs> I, th- I think I'm probably north sixties now. May- maybe. Oh my gosh! So there's yeah. a small percentage of us. There's a small percentage, and <laughs> but and, and and you're my third Australian guest. So I kind of thought that was a nice little like, like a nice little bow, you know. Oh yeah. If you're listening to this and you're like, who is this Australian man talking? Aiden leads, sings, um, has written so many of of, of Hill songs. Biggest songs and, and a ton of my favorite songs. I mean, you, I know, I, sh- I, I think I say this to you every single time I'm with you that, you know, so much of your music has, has really impacted my life and just the life of so many people, the lives of so many people around me. Um, I mean, just I think back to college, I mean, the amount of songs I would listen to you, just if you walked in my dorm room and, and you're on my TV leading, leading live worship. And, you know, that was before I, I even knew you and you've really had just so much of an impact on my life. And I'm just so grateful. To know you and, and and to get to call you a friend, but for those for, but for those listening who you know have maybe heard of you, um, maybe have even haven't heard of you, can you kind of just explain a little bit about who you are and kind of you know how people would would uh, would recognize you? Yeah, um, I mean you did a great job summing me up, and I thought that was pretty cool. But yeah, so I my name's Aiden, spelt weird, A O D H A N. It's Irish. Um, my my dad is from Ireland. My mum is from India. They met in Australia. And they created me. I (laughs) grew up there, um, started attending Hillsong Church in my early teens, um, and then started writing music. I think being a part of a church that where worship is is such a focal point, it impacted me in ways that I still to this day um, as trying to unravel. You know, it was, I think worship at that church is obviously such a huge part of that church. And for me, it's, it's still in me all these years later. So I started writing, getting involved in the worship team and then started university in the middle of university. I was a youth leader at the youth ministry and um, we saw a, a need for worship that represented the, the young people of the church, you know, from whatever it was like, you know, 12 through to 30, there was a gap there in, in our worship expression. And so, a bunch of my friends and I at the time just started writing, didn't know what was going to happen with it all. We just knew that we needed to sing new songs um, in the youth ministry. And very quickly that just became young and free. And so uh, we had no idea it would really turn into what it did. Uh, we we really just had our youth ministry Friday nights in mind. Like We were like, this is, we're, we're singing these songs just for Friday night to a couple hundred people. Um, and then we compiled songs together, recorded it. And then before we knew it, you know, it was really overnight, to be honest, we started traveling and from probably 2013 until 2020, we traveled 200 days a year. So that's, that's me. That's been my life for the last, you know, 10 or so years. Yeah. And I mean, I, the, you know, Young and Free's first album, I mean, you had Sinking Deep and Gracious Tempest on the first album, of Young, <laughs> which is literally insane. You know, but I mean, just, I mean, it's really crazy to think about your first album is like two just huge, huge songs. You know what I mean? And since then you've had Touch of Heaven, Pursue, All I Need Is You, Pride of a Father, um, mm-hmm. Highs and Lows, Whole Heart. I mean, there's so, I, there's literally, you know, if I Google how many songs you've written, there's, there's just a plethora of, um, of things. And, you know, I mean, those Sneaking Deep and Gracious Tempest, I know have just impacted the church so much. And, and it's just crazy to think that that's, you know, that's on the first thing that y'all put out. How has, um, you know, just over the last couple of years, and you, know, you talked about touring up to up to twenty twenty. How has songwriting for you kind of evolved over the years since you really started on the first Young and Free project? Yeah, I mean, it's evolved a lot. I think when we started, 
first of all, I had no idea what I was doing, you know? So there was, it was very, in a way, like out of necessity, you know, we saw a real need for music that represented the youth and there was no one else there to do it. And so we're like, well, I guess we have to do it, but I hadn't really written much before that point. You know, this is, I'd written some songs, um, but nothing great. And I think like at that point there was like a, maybe a mission behind the songwriting, like that, that was like almost like survival, you know, it was like we needed these songs. And so I was writing a lot from that place. And then I think as I've grown older, um, and I'm not old, but like, I think, you know, even 10 years later, it's like the, now a lot of the songs are for my own survival in some ways, you know, like having writing a song is, has been writing songs has been the way that I express like how I feel, what I'm going through, like it's how I pray. Um, and I've learned that along the, along the years, you know, and it's always different in different seasons. But I think now these days you kind of have to, I think this would be the same in any profession. Like once you start doing it a lot, it can be easy to get complacent or, you know, you might go, I mean, yeah, it could apply to anything. It could be like, you could be a chef and you could be like, whatever you make steak or whatever. And you, you know how to make it the exact same way every single day. And it's quite hard to deviate from that. And I think as you know, you become, a, as those things become a little more easier to you, you've got to like begin to like actually still figure out how to like change your approach. You know, maybe, maybe you need to start <laughs> cooking a steak differently. And I think as a songwriter, that's like the biggest challenge is not growing complacent. And so I'm trying now to not keep writing songs how I wrote them five years ago or a year ago or 10 years ago. I, I, I think you need to constantly adapt. And I, I'm in a, a period of trying to figure that out too. Yeah. Do you think there is something, like you said, in, in just the beginning of it, because you were you know, young 20s when Young and Free started and it was kind of just birthed out of, of a necessity. But I also think that there's a beauty to you know, like an innocence and like a purity to songwriting that now, mm -hmm. you know, 10, 12 years later, you're, you know, you know, more theology, you're more like there, there's, there's kind of things that grow over the years of like knowing more scripture, knowing, you know, I think sometimes you can get in your head of like, maybe something that, that used to be an innocent, pure lyric now can be like, well, is it theologically correct? And I've even seen that in some songs that we've helped <clears throat> that, not that I've helped write with Ella, but Ella's done some lyrics and it's like, it's been it's been meaningful to me and it's been beautiful, but then it's like, but is it actually theologically correct? And I know people have had, you know, you're always going to have your people, people that correct, cr critique reckless love or what a beautiful name or whatever. But how do you feel like for you, you've kind of kept, you know, the purity of the songwriting, but also knowing more scripture. I mean, you're, you're, you're more, you know, you're more matured in your faith and you know more things, yada, yada, yada. How do you feel like you've kind of balanced that aspect of your songwriting? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, yeah, I think that's just, it is like a balancing act, you know, you've kind of, you're working it out as you go. I think I remember when we started Young and Free and like, you know, I guess a lot of the critique around that first, those first couple of albums was that it was very much like lovey, like lovey focused and like, you know, some people would say it was shallow um, as in that it wasn't, you know, there wasn't depth in it theologically. Um, and I think, you know, that is true, but that also was just true of who we were. We were young and that was what was real to us. And that's how we understood God at that point. You know, when you're 19, 18, 19, 20, most people are lucky enough to not really have gone through much life at that point. And, you know, and there's obviously exceptions to that. A lot of people that go through a lot of stuff and which, you know, when they're younger, but for a lot of us, you know, the stuff that we're singing about is just our experience of God. And as you grow older and you go through things and life happens and, you know, life isn't, life isn't always easy and, you know, you lose loved ones or you go through heartbreak or whatever it is, you start to rely on God's words in a different way and the songs begin to change in your revelations. And so I think like, yeah, I mean, I kind of forgot what your question was, but I, but I, yeah, I think the as you, I think you have to protect the purity of of songs. Um, but I think by acknowledging what's going on in each season, season, and being real with, okay, you know, 
right now it's actually a great season or whatever it might be for somebody and being true to that you know and so you know you might be going you might have this mountaintop moment where god's revealed something to you or you feel this clarity or that you might be going through an amazing time in your business in your life in your relationships and i think as a writer it's important to write from that perspective too so Mm -hmm. don't always don't always like don't put try to put yourself in another season that you're not in if that makes sense yeah. So I've had to learn that, you know, and I think writing from what's honest to you is always going to create something that's authentic and pure. Yeah. Well, like you said, I feel like those, I feel like those critiques are, well, I think kind of stupid, but also, I mean, you know, if you're writing to youth, <clears throat> the you know youth students don't necessarily need deep theological whatever. I mean, I mean, yes, it's it, it's it's built through the song, which which is good. But I mean, you know, I was listening to only want to sing when I was in high school, right? And just the lyric mm-hmm. of um, can't imagine why I would do this off for hype, which is such a beautiful lyric. And I, I want to ask you about that. But like there is something in youth that does crave, you know, more of a, you know, like a style that y'all were catering to. You know, you're writing to you students and whether people want to call it shallow or surface level or whatever, like the, you're you're writing it to people who need that with where they're at. Right. There aren't many. Mm-hmm. middle school students and high school students who you know s- listen to uncomplicated or best friends and it's like you know well where's the where's script like i don't know I, I just think sometimes we can just get so caught up in like just those things that i just think it makes us i, I just don't think it's beneficial to like just be over overly cynical and just critiquing the ins and outs of of um of all those different things. Yeah. But yeah, I, I love, yeah, I, I, I want to hear that lyric. I want to hear about the, can't imagine why I would do this off for hype. Cause I remember being in youth and like, like that lyric was like such a, it was such a hype lyric, but not, you know, the, it says not, not doing this for hype, yeah. but like something about it yeah. was like so hype. Uh, what's the, do you have like a story behind, behind that lyric? Yeah. I mean, that was, I think we, that song kind of came out of a necessity in that we, you know, we'd had that first album, which had like Alive, Wake, these really like, these songs that really defined who, I think Alive was a song that really defined who Young and Free was going to be. Like until we had Alive, we weren't really sure what Young and Free was. And when we wrote Alive, that song was like, gave us this like, okay, cool. Like maybe we exist to bring joy and to get people dancing and to have fun. And when we got to the second record, it was like we were searching for that kind of thing again. And, um, you know, that there's a paradox in that, you know, we're searching for something that gets the crowd amped up, but then we don't want them to get amped up about just a fun song. We'd rather get them amped up about God. And so that's, you know, I was like, well, we need a song that's like, doom, 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 you know, but why do we need a song that's like that? And then that's what the que- those kind of questions evoked how that song came about. So I remember sitting in a cafe and we had that song and I just was writing all day trying to figure out the lyrics of that song. And I kind of like it, I spent, to be honest, like they're not the most profound lyrics. Like it, they're simple and quite instructional. And that's what I like. Like I like having songs that feel like they're teaching something to the young people. Um, but yeah, I just, I, 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 I knew first of all that if you played that song without lyrics, you could still get the crowd jumping because of like how the music is. And I was like, well, maybe there's a lesson. How do we, how do we get people jumping for like the right reasons? (laughs) If that makes sense. And that's how that lyric came about. AG1 is something that I drink literally every morning. I've been drinking it for a while now. I love to drink it in the mornings before I go to my workout. And even when I'm not working out, I still love to drink my AG1 in the mornings. And something else that I love so much about them is I can take it with me on the go. It is a daily foundational nutritional supplement that supports whole body health and it's something that I love to do every day and even when I'm on the road. My wife and I travel a lot of different places and so many places we go, there are no healthy options and I love bringing my AG1 travel packs with me. And it's something that gives me health, like I said, when I'm on the road. And there's so many benefits. I feel like it gives me uh, health in the mornings. I feel like it helps with my digestion system. It helps with my mood and my clarity. And I feel like it gives me energy and focus. And AG1 was designed with ease in mind so that you can live healthier and better without having to do a lot. It's seriously the healthiest thing that you can do in just under a minute. So I take a bunch of different things when you can just mix one scoop of powder and water each day. And it's that easy. 
And AG1 is packed with 75 vitamins, minerals, probiotics, and whole food source ingredients of high quality that give me major benefits like gut and mood support, boosted energy, and even healthier looking skin, hair, and nails. And AG1 is an all-in-one foundational nutrition formula that makes it easy for me to cover all my nutritional bases every single day. But you don't have to just take my word for it. I've been drinking AG1 for a while now, and I've gotten so many others to hop on the train as well. I got John David from the Duck Call Room. You've heard me mention his name before. A lot of the Duck Call Room guys are on it now. They love to drink it. My parents, my brother, my sister-in-law, uh, you heard me talk about my, na- my neighbors before. They're drinking it now too. So I've got a lot of people to hop on the AG1 train, and they are seeing major benefits just like I am. They hated taking pills and supplements, and they wanted something that actually tasted delicious. So if you want to take ownership of your health, Try AG1 and get a free one-year supply of vitamin D and five free AG1 travel packs with your first purchase. Go to drinkag1.com slash huff. That's drinkag1.com slash huff. Go check it out today. Yeah, no, I I, I mean, I, I was just listening to that song the other day and like I, that really does take me back. I mean, like I said, I was in high school. I think I was a senior in high school and we were at a at a church summer camp and that was like the biggest song of the summer. And then my uh, my freshman year of high school, at, at the same thing, that was kind of more So Will I was just coming out and there were, there were some other, there were some other like Young and Free stuff. I, I don't really remember, remember what the Young and Free song was that camp, but the, the year before, like I said, it was um, Only Want to Sing. It was, uh, I think One Thing was right around the same time too, um, which yeah. I know that, you, yeah. I mean, those albums were just, were so pivotal for me in my life. Um, But with Young and Free, what do you feel like, um, you know, like you said, you were, how old were you when when Young and Free really started? Yeah, like 19, 20. So had you been following Jesus all all the way up until, I mean, was was there a moment before that? I, I like started coming to church around 12, 13 and probably made a decision around that time too. So yeah, it'd been like seven years. I would say about seven years by the point, by the time I was doing any of that stuff. So yeah, I'd known Jesus my whole life. I grew up in like a, a Catholic family that, but like very focused around Jesus. So I was, and I went to a Catholic school and we had like a bit of a charismatic Catholic school. So I was I'm very aware of God and I, and, and Jesus. Like I, I think when I made a decision to follow Jesus, it didn't feel like this radical change for me because I was almost, I almost had always acknowledged Jesus and everything as a child, but the decision was more like my own going, okay, actually I'm going to, I'm going to commit my life to to following him. Yeah. No, that's awesome. Well, when we, you know, we were together a few weeks ago at, at, at Sadie's LO conference, which was, which was, which was awesome and super powerful. And I was kind of talking to you backstage a little bit, um, just about really what's the difference, you know, now versus, back then right you know you you, you say you like mm-hmm. to talk more about songwriting than really leading because for leading it's kind of you know individualistic it's everyone's kind of different all, and all those things yeah and you're kind of talking about just over the years how you've just developed more confidence and i think that comes naturally that's the same with anything you do right that's the same with speaking with 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 leading with i mean with with leading a company you you get confidence over time so it's you know it's you can apply it in, in, in spiritual aspects, but also too, you know, you can see people who gain more confidence in themselves and can kind of lose the, you know, the the necessity that now we've talked about, kind of the dependency on God. How do you feel like, what do you feel like that tension is for you of, you know, like you said, you're on the road 200 plus days a year. So you, you do get good at what you do, but at the same time, like it's not, like there still has to be something deeper than just trusting yourself and being confident in yourself. Like, how do you still find that tension or maybe not even tension, just that balance of, you know, you've done this before you are good at what you do, but there also still has to be a dependency on God to, to see you through it. Yeah. Um, I, I've, I've been, you know, I, I, my whole life I've always gotten nervous. You know, I've always had this, um, like there's a confidence in, there's a confidence in in the truth that I know everything's going to work out, you know. So my confidence isn't so much in my own abilities. Um, my confidence is in God, that's for sure. And but in terms of like getting up to lead worship or whatever that is, like I get super nervous and I get super timid. I get like 
I overthink it for sure. Um, you know, even like in the lead up to leading worship, I can be find it hard to sleep and all those things because I understand the weight of it, like of what it can mean. Um, I don't want to do a bad job, which, you know, I guess that's also just, I'm, I'm a bit of a perfectionist. Um, but yeah, as, I mean, as I've gotten, as I've done it more and more, you know, I have begun to fully, I mean, we always say like, it has nothing to do with us, you know, it says everything to do with God. Like God's going to do what he wants to do at the end of the day. It doesn't wedge vessels. We say all those things, but I think as you do it more and more and more and more, you realize that it really is only God that this is all about. And he's going to use me or he's going to use you or this person or that person. It doesn't matter. He's obviously using us right now. And that's amazing. And we're so grateful and blessed, but like there's, this could be anything. It could be, this could be anyone. It could look like anything and God, God would use it. And that's given me this, it's humbled me in a lot of ways to just be like, all right, whatever. If, if you've, if I'm leading worship at, you know, low conference on Saturday morning, that's because God had already had this planned. So I'm just going to rest in that. And that's been a real good, that's been a really easy way to deal with like being nervous and also giving me a confidence to just be like, it's not on me. Yeah, that's so cool. I've never really, yeah, I've never really thought about it like that. That's really cool. How do you feel like, you know, because Young and Free really kind of was at the onset of really, I would say, an exponential growth of like social media. Like I think Instagram came out in 2012 or so, it was some 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 year around around right there. But a lot of people, and I'm sure you see it, you know, I'm sure you see it a lot. We see it a good bit, but so many people want that idea of like the spotlight or to get to a stage and then kind of, you know, it can be easy to desire, um, you know, fame in the sense and then not just fame, but like fame from a Christian standpoint of like Sadie gets asked all the time, like, I want to do what you do, you know? And I feel like the intention can be good, but a lot of it is because like it's wanting to do what you do, but doing it on a bigger platform. Right. And, you know, young and free really was at the beginning of. Um, I mean, like I said, gracious tempest and seeking deep and alive, and uh, all the songs are on, are on y'all's first album. So, so to some people, it could be, you know, y'all were an instant success. Um, but for you, you know, people don't see the the long nights and the early mornings and just the kind of the grit that that goes into those things. But what would you say? Um, you know, just that idea of an instant success versus actually building to what you've built today. Um, and maybe to the people who want, you know, who see you leading and they're like, I want to do that. But then they don't see, you know, all the years that took place in your life personally before you became famous or a bigger platform and leading in front of tens and hundreds of thousands of people. I guess like, well, first of all, when young and free started, like we, I, I really do like, we had no idea that it would, look like it looked like you know we we i had no expectations of touring and no idea that people would even sing the songs or hear the songs like the motivation and intention was like what i said before was completely like to serve our local youth ministry and beyond that we didn't even think about that you know i i was in university studying to do marketing like and i was volunteering at church and that was the same for everybody else who was involved. Like, and I was working at a kitchen washing dishes. So like there was no, for me, I wasn't like, Oh, this is my, this is my chance to like make it. I didn't even know about like Christian fame or whatever that is. Cause that's, well, I'm from Australia. So, you know, I didn't, there wasn't, I didn't have that grasp. And I think in a lot of ways, that was probably God protecting me and the others, because I think when you are, when you do have those temptations of being a star or having influence, like, like I really do feel for people, young people today, because it, it's it's unavoidable to have those thoughts, you know. And then mm -hmm. I, and I'm not to not to say that those thoughts weren't there at all for us, because of course. But today you're plagued with it, like social media. Everyone's got a podcast. Everyone's got um, a band coming out. Everyone's got songs coming out. Everyone's doing something. And it was it wasn't like that before. But I, I think, like you know my advice to somebody who feels that way is kind of just like 
you know, firstly, it's like having a good community, good friends that you can bounce these ideas off with and, and understand and trying to get to the core of why, what your motivation is, whether it be ministry or whatnot or whatever, it could be anything. Like, what is the motivation? Like, because if the motivation for starting a business is to look cool because you have a business, well, then the business isn't going to succeed because you should start a business because you're, you love what the business is about. You feel like you have, you have something that can help people or you have a skill that not anyone else does and it makes sense. But I think like, and I think that's a really simple way to break it down. But Mm -hmm. like, do you want to lead worship because you feel called by God to lead his people to him? Do you feel called to be a servant to lay your life down? And if you can answer all those things, honestly, go, yeah, I am. Can you do that without any fame or success? And if the answer to that is, no, I actually do want influence and success, which is not like influence and success aren't bad things to, to want. But if that's more important to you than actually just doing the job of leading people to God, then I would, then I would wrestle with the motivation. I would ask questions about the motivation. So yeah, I mean, for us, we just, I just didn't have, I didn't know what it was going to look like. So when it did, when it did look like touring and success, well, then we had to go, okay, how do we want to, deal with this. And I think I, we were lucky, Young and Free was lucky because we had, we all came up together at the same time, all friends my age. We all knew each other's life in Sydney, Australia. Like we all knew each other well. So we together could collectively keep each other in check about stuff. You know, if that was, if I had, if Young and Free was just me and I, I had put out an album and then I was touring all by myself, I think it would have been a lot harder to, to, not get a big head or not to but i think having this group really was a protection for us from yeah. ever feeling yeah yeah that's so cool you know what I mean? well even even just thinking about you know if worship hadn't have worked out and you did end up doing something with marketing i really think i would have <laughs> i really think you could sell me any product i really do <laughs> i think i think if you just cold call me man. i think if you just cold call <laughs> me I, I think i would easily spend you know, <laughs> I don't know what my limit would be. But you could, uh, you could definitely hook me into buying something pretty outrageous. Yeah, that's great. Well, I'll, you know, maybe I'll get into that then. Now, having two daughters, there are always these unexpected medical bills that I get, and not only that, but even in the past when I was just single and by myself, I also had unexpected medical bills. I had broke my nose when I was in eighth grade. I had other little phantom injuries that I had gone to the doctor before in the past, and I had these unexpected medical bills. And not only is it annoying when you get an unexpected medical bill, it's discouraging and it's even you know scared at times when you get one and you are struggling to find out how to pay for it. So I have two questions for you. One, how are you paying for your family's health care? And two, how's it working out for you? If it's working out perfectly, then great. And if not, I want to offer you a biblical solution, Samaritan Ministries. Samaritan Ministries is a community of Christians paying one of those medical bills. It's not insurance, it's assurance that you're part of a healthcare shared community where members care for one another spiritually and financially when medical need arises. So here are the three reasons why it could be right for you and your family. One, there are no networks which put you in control of your family's healthcare. You know what's best for them. So you choose the doctors and hospitals you go to and have a say in the treatments they receive. Two, you're actually part of a Christian community. When you have a medical need, fellow members send money directly to you to try and help pay your medical bills. And you'll do the same for all of them, all while praying for and encouraging one another. And three, you can join today. Start healthcare sharing with Samaritan Ministries the day you complete your membership application or choose a future month. It's up to you. So whether it's a broken bone, an unexpected diagnosis, or another medical emergency, you will find comfort knowing you're connected to 80,000 Christian households across the nation who stand ready to care for one another spiritually and financially during a time that's needed the most. And it could also be more affordable than what you're doing now. So check it out at SamaritanMinistries.org slash Huff. That's SamaritanMinistries.org slash Huff join today. Well, no, it is cool because, you know, I mean, I think you can look back at really just the birthplace of young and free. And, you know, if, if a lot of it was, you know, to want to do, to want to be big and successful, which, which like you said, those aren't bad things, but like, if that's the motivation other than just to be with God and, and just to do what you feel like he's called you to do, then that's when it gets, that's when it gets tricky. Right. Um, but mm-hmm. I do think that the young and free was so 
I don't want to say successful, but I, I think it was so poignant and people were so drawn to it because there was like a genuineness to it and there was a purity to it and there was just this sense of just worship. It wasn't like, you know, and, and it was birthed, like you said, out of, out of necessity. It wasn't, and, yeah. I, and I think you feel like that. I, I think you feel that when you still listen to, I keep going back to Sinky Deep and Gracious Tempest because I think those are the two biggest songs on the album and like they're led across the world. And I think that if, if I just don't know if y'all would have, and I could, I could be wrong by saying that. I just don't know if it would have been the same spirit on the album and even y'all would have the same songs if it wasn't, if it didn't come from that just genuine, we want to just get back to our local community. You know, if it yeah. was like, let's write these songs to impact the world, which like you said, aren't bad things, but I think there is something that like, whatever you do locally, that's what you should be doing globally, right? That's what we always say with LO. It's like with Sadie stuff. It's like, if we're doing all these things globally, but we're not doing them locally, then what's the point? Like, that's why we're doing LO yeah. sister conference here. Cause like, if we're going to go speak in Norway or whatever, but yet we're not giving back locally to our community, then, then why are we doing that? Right. And I think there's mm-hmm. something that's so cool about just the birthplace of it, of just being a bunch of friends, you know, in your te- in, in teenagers and you're writing these huge songs, but it's not the point of it. Wasn't just to write a huge song. It was, this is, yeah. this is what we feel like God's stirring in us. And this is what's going to impact our local youth ministry. And that ended up impacting thousands of youth ministries across the world. Yeah. Thank God. Yeah. I mean, we didn't, yeah. I think like the big thing that I look back on it and I when you know, just to come back to that one point you said, like about, you know, it wouldn't have been what it was had, you know, we not whatever, had we, had we, you know, been motivated by the wrong things. I think like, obviously that's true. I, 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 and I don't, I, I think God obviously like blesses things that are pure and whatnot. But I think like, you know, we also, we really did like feel that God was asking us and compelling us to do something that was fresh and different for that generation. And, you know, if we, you know, when I look back now, I didn't know this at the time, but had, had we wanted like success or whatever, or we wanted to, we wouldn't have written songs that sounded like young and free sounds like, because when we, I remember doing a live, having a live finished and like, we weren't even allowed to sing that in like big church because it was too clubby or too poppy. And like, you know, and so automatically, like, you know, the success for a Christian band is to have churches sing your songs and to, to, you know, have that, whatever, that support. And we didn't have that support initially because what we were doing was so counter to that. Yeah. And, you know, someone motivated by success would be like, oh, okay, maybe we should do something different then. Like, maybe we should do something that the church likes. But we, we kind of knew that God was asking us to do something different and we took the risk. And I think there's something in that too for people out there who, looking at going oh, hey, i want to do something that's significant i think first of all you got to look at what's in your hands what's god what god has put in your hands but then then also go what can i bring to the world that's unique like what can i offer that adds value as opposed to you know copying something else and i think that's a huge thing like and it does going out on your own and doing something unique and different is a risk and um, but I think God off honors that too. I think God honors when we step out in faith and step out in boldness. I think that's like, you know, I look at the young and free thing. I didn't know it at the time, but like a lot of those risky decisions that we made when I was younger, I would question them now, you know, because I'm older and I've, and you become a little bit more like you're scared to take risks. And when you get older, you, you're scared to like do something that's like putting yourself out there. And I look back at my younger self and I'm like, man, I need that, that kind of vigor Yeah. that I, I'm unafraid yeah. feeling. No, that's so cool. Cause I mean, that, that, that's essentially what I was saying at the beginning. Like there's that, you know, like I said, when you're 18, 19, you're writing these, you know, you said lovey-dovey songs to God and it's impacting millions of people around the world. Like it, it you were doing that without this sense of like, you know, is this biblically correct? Is this, how does this tune sound? Are big churches going to be able to sing? Like, like that's what I'm saying. There, there's that innocence of it, innocence of it, of just like, we're just going to do it. And I do think that God yeah. blesses that. Like, like that's what, that's, that's the cool thing. You know, you're, you know, you're thir- in your thirties now, you're a little older, you're more wise. And 
it it's going to impact the way that you write songs, but there still ha- there still is a you know an innocence in it. Like, and I think that's what's so cool about just the beginning of Young and Free. It's like y'all are doing this without this, without just consuming of like, are people going to think this is whatever or, or, or all these other things that I think we can get so caught up in it. And I think because I do want to ask you about this too, because there is. I, th- I do think there's a balance, right? Like there is this idea of discernment, but then there also is, I think sometimes we can just have like a fear of man too in things. Mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. you might be able to speak to this. You might you might not want to speak to it, but um, you know, just that idea of there are some Christian songs that you know you can think of, like How He Loves Us, like A Sloppy Wet Kiss, like that lyric, or What a Beautiful Name. Like there's things that people don't like about You Didn't Want Heaven Without Us. Like how do you... What is that distinction between like discernment of like, you know, if I write this lyric, some people might have backlash over it. So you want to discern that to like, to whatever. But then again, if you feel like God's given you this, this lyric or the song, you want to honor him with it. So you don't want to be like fear of man from like potential like Pharisees of like, who are just critical about songwriting. So where for you... Because I mean, I'm, you've you've probably written lyrics before, and you're like that might offend people, or people might not like that. How do you? Where's that distinction at for you of like discernment for people listening, but also you don't want to give in to a fear of man. I mean, because I mean, if Corey Asbury didn't write "Reckless Love," you know, I mean, that song's impacted yeah, totally hundred mi- yeah, that hundreds of millions of people. Insane. You know, but it, if he mm-hmm. was like God's. But yet if he's like, well, people might not want me to say God's love is reckless, but that's not what he's saying, but that's how, people, that's how some people can take it, right? So how do you feel like there's that distinction of, you know, I, I this is what's impacted me and this is what I feel like God's giving me. But then again, I want to discern people, but I don't want to live in just this fear of them to overly critique something. Yeah. Um. Well, you know, I think... At Hillsong, we were very protected in in this process because, you know, every song that we would write um, would go through our teaching pastors who are called Robert and Amanda Ferguson, and they're, they're amazing people and, you know, theologians and very wise and um, amazing at interpreting scripture and theology. And so every song that we would write would go through them and be checked and made sure that everything was – clear that everything was theologically correct and so that process really did help even me as a young writer to understand uh the way things can be perceived you know you could be saying something that is biblically correct but is it can it be perceived a different way or is the language insinuating something else so that process was really good helped me to understand the importance of like especially when you're writing songs for the church you're essentially putting God's word into people's heart and people remember lyrics more than they remember reading something like you sing mm-hmm. things. And that's why singing is so it's so powerful because you, you sing things into life, you sing things into your spirit. And so, you know, that process is really good. Help me. But I think at the end of the day, like, you know, I, I I've always kind of had the opinion of like, you know, you're never going to make everyone happy. People are always going to have something to say. People are always gonna. Um, people are always gonna want to see things through the lens which they they deem right or necessary. And so, what might be completely fine and great to one person could mean something something different to somebody else. And I, you know, I think as as a writer and as you know, a creative person who like. I kind of, you have to trust your instincts and trust what you feel like feels right. Um, and what you feel like God maybe even be telling you is right. Like, yeah. And, but I think it's good to have counsel in the process and to, to make sure that what you, if you're writing church songs, like I think if you're writing songs outside of the church, like, I mean, just do what you want, express yourself, write however you want to write. I think, but in the church, like when you have a, if you, if your job is to write songs, for the church to sing, I think there should be a, a level of diligence to making sure that it's theologically correct, but also not not doing that to the extent that it wipes away the artistic or creative expression. Because I think I, I think there is like you know the Psalms are full of like like in what look like poetry and expressive language and 
that's the stuff that actually moves your heart. And so I, I think you can't, you can't make everything so straight that you lose the gifts that God gives us, which is a creativity and expression. And so there's a balance. And I think, you know, reckless love is the greatest example because yeah, so many people would be like, you know, you can't say God's love is reckless, but that didn't stop millions of people experiencing God's presence in the song and millions of people understand what he means by saying God's love is reckless is that it's, it's almost wasteful because he just gives it without return. And that is reckless. It's reckless. It's reckless for me to grab my coffee and pour it on the ground. But I can do that if I know I have an abundance of coffee and I actually don't because I finished my pot of coffee, but God, you know what I mean? And so there's so many ways you can view that. It's like reckless can also mean, you know, being silly and whatever or stupid and like running around and knocking over chairs for no reason, but that's not what we're saying. So I don't know. Sorry. I rambled on a little, little bit, but no, I wanted you to yeah. because, because it is like, I mean, and that's something I can wrestle with. It's like, I just don't think I've ever listened to a song and been like, you know, my first, like, because, because I mean, like I said, I do think that there is something like good about, you know, mentors and having things flush the people and because, I mean, maybe if you listen to a song and you kind of backtrack and you kind of wonder, or you can kind of think about scripture or whatever, but I just think for me, I just don't think I've ever listened to a song and my first inclination has been like, is this is this theologically correct? Like, is this biblically whatever? Like, because I do think that can come over time, but it's like, if, if, if I listen to a new song that comes out and my first instinct is to want to critique it or to like question it, then I think that's a problem with yourself. You know, I don't think that's... I don't think there's anything on the songwriter or the song. It's like you need to check your own heart of like if you're going into a new song or at, and you're at church or whatever, you're in your you're in your car and your first thing is like wanting to critique and to kind of break it down, then it's like I, I just don't think that's beneficial for anybody. I, I just – I don't know. Yeah. I, I, I just can't relate to that in any way of like I'm listening to a new song and my first inclination is to want to – break it down and critique it and, and take it to scripture. I, I don't, I don't know. Some people do that. That's just not in any way how I do things. Yeah. I know. Yeah. And I, you got it that. And then that is, yeah, I think it's just, it's just keeping an open, open spirit of mind. I think, you know, being allowing, like allowing someone else's way of saying something to teach you something, even if it, even if you don't agree with something, agree with it i think it's always good to op- look at things with an open mind and i mean if you don't agree with it or you don't like it i mean that's that's fine you can make that decision yourself and yeah i mean, I mean yeah i mean this, this obviously this doesn't include like extreme cases where someone's writing some something like some heresy or something yeah like, no no for sure different. yeah yeah no for yeah, sure yeah. like but i mean if if you said like you know a sloppy wet kiss and it's like but yet you're like trying to break that out theologically i'm just like that to me that just it like why do that you know or yeah, like totally or and like that, and that's and that it's a loss to yourself really oh yeah you're, for sure you're, yeah yeah or like or like i know people like the no longer slaves i'm no longer slave to fear like people won't sing that i'm no longer slave to fear because they're still fearful it's like okay like but that's not what the song is saying right it's like it's it's that you're no longer a slave to it. like we still like yes we still get fearful like you might still get fearful next week going to sing somewhere but it's like but you're not a slave to it, right? That's like that's not that doesn't own you, maybe like how it used to, uh, or like I said, like what a beautiful name, like you didn't want heaven without us, like. But it's like that's not true, God. Like so, I'm just yes, like there is a dip, and if you're listening, it's like there is a difference between like heresy in a song, but like a versus like a simple like sentence lyric of like you, yeah, totally. of, like you want to you know manufacture something and like make this something that's not what the what the songwriter. Just trying to do yeah, it. For so, sure. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, thanks for clarifying. Yeah, no, I'm not, I'm in no, yeah. If so, oh, no, I wasn't yeah, saying that no, anyway, no, but no, yeah, no. No, yeah, I'm saying someone yeah. could be listening and be like, well, someone could write a, you know, a, a heretical song and it's like, yeah, obviously I'm not, you know, if there's a song that's like clearly like not biblically accurate, then that's different versus just a simple lyric or a melody that, you yeah, know, that you can take it one way, and that's not it's it, it. You're you're misconstruing it totally. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Well, you know, we've kind of talked a little bit about you know you you talked a little bit about touring and everything, but aside, even as, even just aside from touring, I think you honestly travel more than just about anybody that I know. 
Like I feel like you are never in <laughs> you are never in California. You're always somewhere else. But you yeah. do you do so many awesome things and you not only not only that, but you're also just super creative, whether it's with songwriting or just with life, you know, just looking at you, you're just you just scream like I'm a creative person. Um like you're just so creative in everything you do, but do you feel like yeah. do you feel like you are more creative when your life is sporadic, or do you feel like you're more creative when you kind of get settled into a routine for a little bit? Uh, it's a great question. Um, I think I'm I, I definitely am more creative when I'm like have a routine, and I've learned that about myself over the last couple of years. Like, I definitely do travel a lot um, too much, which I don't. That's not I don't really want to be doing that. Um, but it's just been a busy couple of years. But I think, yeah, I think routine for me has been, is a game changer. You know, I was, I was in LA actually, like I had a solid two or three months or like maybe like, maybe like eight weeks, which is big for me in one place just to be straight. Yeah. And, um, it was, that was, I, I feel like I would gone to a good wave. I need routine. I think like, and I think every creative, whether they know it or not, like, would benefit from some sort of routine that just giving yourself some sort of borders. I think having like having some, some disciplines allow in those gaps to be as free as you want. But without it, sometimes I think you, you like for me anyway, I get, it goes, I go chaotic when there's too much going on. Yeah. Well, Cause I actually, I actually, this is funny because this is right after I saw you in February when we were in Malibu city speaking at Pepperdine, you were, you were leading worship. And because I, I was already starting to like prep for this podcast I wanted to do with you. And I typed that in my phone, like, are you more creative when your life is sporadic or when you're more in a routine? Because after I saw you from uh, when we were at, at Pepperdine, you were, I think you were going to like London and then Ireland and then like New York, then you were like back in LA. And I was just thinking yeah. like, because, you know, you do write so many songs, you you are on so many big projects, which not even just you know, young and free, like you have your own stuff. You help with Vu, you help me. You just did an album with Anna Golden that you helped write, write, write a song on. You like, you are, you really are just everywhere and you, you do do so much, but then again, you do like your life is so spontaneous. Like you are like you, you, you know, you, you do do so many things. And I was just like, I wonder if, I wonder if he feels like he's more, you know, creative when you're like mm. life, when you're, you know, there's spontaneity, like when you're spontaneous or when you're more kind of rooted and, and grounded. Well, I had, yeah, I think I, I definitely want, I leave my life open for spontaneity, but I, I also know that's like, that's a luxury that I have right now because I'm single, I'm um, living in a new country. I'm not, I don't have like my only real responsibility is to create songs <laughs> and so, and to go and sing and do things like that, which is like a blessing. But I also know that it's just a season because I know, you know, when I do get married, I'm not going to have the ability to be spontaneous with my life, but I, I kind of, was, I've always wanted, you know, I, when I was in Sydney, obviously I was working, you know, like I was working at church and, you know, there was more, I had staff meetings and different responsibilities throughout the week that I had that I had always at that time been like, Oh God, like I, just, I need like some, I need some space. I need some like freedom to be able to just do whatever feels right in the moment. And now I've had that for the last couple of years and I kind of want that again, you know, it's funny. Uh -huh. it's, a, like, it's just, it's, it's how life works, but you know, I think I'm learning that you can't, I, I need not one or the other. It needs to be like a, so we're working that out. Yeah. Well, you said living in a new country, you've been living in the U S for the last little, a little over two years. What's been the, di what's, what's been the biggest difference for you moving from Australia to America? Um, biggest difference would be the food. The food is like pretty rough here. <laughs> I would say, um, I like, I love it, but it's, yeah, definitely, you definitely, it definitely affects you differently. I'd say that much. Um, well, well uh, yeah, but so much of that could be your, could be your lifestyle choices. I mean, maybe, but I think like, I think it's just that it's, America's so big. So, there's like everything has to be. I mean, America's like Australia has like 25 million. America has what, like nearly 400 million. Uh -huh. So much bigger. So like everything's more mass. I don't know. It's like in Australia, everything's very like farm to table. Like food's very healthy. Like there's ingredients or whatever that are illegal in Australia that are not illegal here that are in the food, whatever. I, I'm not going to get into it, but that would be the biggest difference. But then the benefits are for me, like obviously being able to do what I do is a lot easier. 
when I was in Australia, I was flying back and forth, which, you know, 20 hours, like back and forth, you know, up to 10 times a year, which is pretty exhausting and unsustainable. So the travel is a lot easier here. A lot of my friendships are here now, which has been awesome. Um, I, I love America. America's awesome. I feel like there's, it just feels like no ceiling on, on life in a lot of ways, which is really cool. Yeah, that's awesome. Well, I, I, I never would really have guessed you just said food. I don't know what I don't know what I what I what I was expecting <laughs> to say, but f- that's food. a huge difference. That actually has been a, a, even like I have, you know, my um, my mate Johnny Ray is he lives in the same building as me and he lives upstairs. But I would say like that would be one of the main things we talk about. Yeah, is food like yeah. it's crazy. Well, it's funny. You just notice it. Well, because you're living in like probably one of the best places in the country to actually go get food at, and the healthiest. Which is funny that you're saying that. Like, mm-hmm. if you're well, living, the food, in- if the food is good, it's just that you notice it. Like, I could have, I could have the same meal, exact same meal here in Australia, and I would feel completely different yeah. after. Well, it. I'm just saying, if you if you live where I'm at, you would probably die. Then, I mean, <laughs> you're living in LA, <laughs> which is like the healthiest. <laughs> I, I had good barbecue with you. That was pretty good. Yeah, but I mean, you can't eat barbecue every day. I mean, you could. You could. Yeah, but true. You could. Well, yeah, you could. Yeah, you could. I could. Yeah. Well, I know. <laughs> I, I, I know. That, I know that you've been working on um, a bunch of different stuff, but mm-hmm. you know, you're you really are doing so many things, and it's almost every single a ton of songs I see now, whether it's on Worship Now on Spotify or whatever. So many of them say featuring Aiden King. But for you, what's uh? What's next for you? What are you What are you working on? What are you excited about? Where can uh, people check out some things that you've that you've got going on coming up soon? Yeah, um, yeah, I've been working on a lot. Um, I've been working on my own record, so um, and it's getting mixed right now. It's a, it's a worship album, and I feel really really stoked about it. It's been a long time coming. I've kind of wrestled around a lot trying to figure out what I wanted to do. I was going. I wrote a whole different record that was not a worship record. And which I love, but I've kind of come back around and now I've landed back on like this worship album. And yeah, I feel like it's a, I feel like it's some of the best stuff that I've done. I'm really pumped with it. It feels right. It definitely feels like God led in a lot of ways because I don't think I would have done it had I not felt like the prompting from God. And um, yeah, I don't know. So it's it's getting mixed right now. Hopefully be out at the beginning of next year, but I mean, I I don't don't know. I actually don't know exactly. So. Yeah, well, I'm still I'm still so butthurt that you have not sent me any songs on it because I keep I keep <laughs> texting you to send me just one, just a glimpse. But that's okay. I I'm uh, I, no, I'm, I, will. I'm re- I will, I will, I will. I'm really uh, I'm really not that offended by it. What was the song that you helped write with Lania? And I think you sing it with them. Alonica. I, I yeah, I don't, yeah. I don't I don't sing it. That would have been cool. But no, they yeah, we wrote a song. I wrote a song with Paul and Jake um, called Alonica. Yeah, which I is cool. I don't yeah. understand it. Can you can you explain it to me? And yeah, so like, well, it actually, like, we, yeah, it's kind of like, essentially, we wanted to write a song about like learning to be okay with like being by yourself. So like, and not not in the sense of like being without people, but like learning to love yourself. And so it was like a lone occur is like this place that you can go to where you actually feel like life's awesome. Because I think pe- a lot of people struggle, obviously, with the idea of like sitting at home by themselves, you know, and not even in the sense of not being, not having a partner or whatever, but just they struggle. They need like their codependent and what whatnot. And I think we wrote the song with that in mind going like, how do we, I know for Paul, that was something that he had been thinking about. And even for me too, like moving to a new country by myself, like I lived at home with my family with, you know, a whole bunch of brothers or whatever. And then like, I've just moved to LA I'm by myself and like, this song really is just about that, like Alonica being this place, like you know, yeah. an isolated place that you're cool and it's and it's awesome. Yeah. Well, I didn't I, I didn't know if it was like a playoff of like L A, like Alonica. No. Because when I was hearing, well, it, it was kind it was of like, a playoff Antarctica. Antarctica. Yeah. Okay. You guys call it Antarctica. We call it Antarctica in Australia. Antarctica. That's funny. Well, no, because like L A, I was like Alonica. It, it kind of has like a similar. Like instead yeah. of like, I mean, it could be that too. I don't know. Yeah, it could be that. Interesting, interesting. Well, I want to end yeah, with. It is, it is. I want to end with you. Um, you know, what advice would you give to someone who's listening, who either wants to be a songwriter, wants to be a worship leader? What um, what just airplane passing advice would you give to someone who kind of desires uh, to write songs for the church or who wants to you know lead for their local congregation? Get involved in your local worship team. Um. Sh- 
share your songs with other people, find a mentor to find somebody that you can, uh, look up to. And I think a lot of people, I think you, you'd be surprised. That there's a, a lot more people are willing to ment. People want to mentor. People want to help. So ask and don't worry about rejection because songwriting world is full of rejection. Find a mentor, find somebody to co-write with, um, be okay with your own voice. Like don't feel like you need to write songs that sound like other people, like find your, your space. And that takes time. Um, I'm trying to think what else, like practically, I think like just spend time doing it. Like, you know, and if, and you know, if, if it doesn't come naturally, maybe you should sing the Psalms, like play chords or whatever it is, or sing the melodies of the Psalms and just try to learn how that even works. That'd be my advice. I mean, that's really, there's low, it's all, that's all over the place, but yeah. Yeah. And be no, yourself, perfect. have, have fun. I love it. Well, next time, next time we do something maybe like this, I want you to, um, every time I ask you a question, I want you to sing your answer. I just thought about that. I, I want you to. Yeah, great. I'll, yeah, I can do that next time for sure. The whole pie, See, I think I, we probably could have shaved off 20 minutes if you, if you sang, if you sang every answer. I should have. What was I doing? I don't know. It's it's, it's too early. You, you just finished your morning coffee. I did. I know. I'm, I'm racing to get another one in a minute. Awesome, man. Well, thank you so much for joining me, bro. I, uh, Dude, love you, bro. That's grateful awesome. for you. Love you. And um, yeah, I uh, love, lo- love getting to do collaborative things with you here and there. And um, yeah, just, just grateful yeah. to know you and grateful to call you friends. So thank you for your advice. I know it's going to impact Same. a lot of people. And yeah, just keep doing what you're doing. Thanks, bro. I love you, man. Love you. Good to see ya.